Um, now we are going to pass the slides for our next speaker. Philippe Huss, uh, Phil, or Phil Huss. <laughs> Phil is a postdoctoral fellow in the Raman lab at the University of Wisconsin Medicine, where he studies bacteriophage host interactions. He investigates how genetic perturbations influence the sequence function landscape of phages and their bacterial host. His current research extends his doctoral work using large unbiased libraries of phage variants with the goal of engineering programmable programmable synthetic fates for diverse biotechnology applications. And the talk of Phil has today is understanding and engineering bacteriophages by exploring sequence function landscapes. So Great. whenever you're ready, go ahead. You, just a sanity check. Can you see my slides and can you hear me? <laughs> Good. Yes. Good. Okay. So well, thank you for that introduction and, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this series. I think this is a really interesting seminar series and I'm excited to share some of the work that we have today. Okay. So yeah, this is a little different than the focus of a lot of talks in this series because we work with bacteriophages and a bacteriophage is a bacterial virus. So they only infect bacteria, not human cells. Uh, if you don't know what they look like, shown here is a colored TEM of phages during infection where they would land on a target bacteria and inject material to then hijack uh, that bacterial cell. So we and many others are interested in learning how to best leverage bacteriophages uh, for editing microbial communities. So this is taking a phage and targeting and eliminating or modifying a specific bacteria in a community and then leaving everything else alone. Typical applications for this include microbiome editing or for using phages to target bacteria that have become resistant to multiple antibiotics. And phages have a several uh, key advantages that make them interesting candidates as tools for these applications. So first, they're naturally precise. Uh, one phage typically only infects one or a few different kinds of bacteria. They're highly abundant. Uh, they're actually the most abundant organism in the biosphere, so it's easy to go out and, and procure natural phages that might uh, target a bacteria of interest. They replicate reliably, or at least oligolytic ones do, um, so they can self-dose to remove bacteria in a community. And most importantly for us, and the focus of the talk, is they're engineerable. That means we could go into their genome and modify them to make them more effective. But there's reasons why you don't see them used for many specific applications out in the wild. You can't go down to Walgreens and get a phage cocktail to treat something. And that's because natural phages face some fundamental limitations that we have to overcome. So first, the flip side of that natural precision coin is a narrow host range, which means finding the right combination of natural phages to effectively target all strain variants can be very challenging to do. They also typically don't have amazing efficacy, so they have trouble fully killing a bacterial population. They sort of exist in a little bit of an equilibrium with their, uh, with their host. Resistance occurs, so just like uh, resistance to antibiotics, bacteria become resistant to phage. And finally, they're very frequently poorly characterized. So we have little understanding of if we have the best phage for the job, and they tend to be administered in cocktails where mutual interactions tend to be poorly understood. So a broad overreaching goal of the work we do in the Ramon lab, one of the goals, is to leverage the natural advantages of phages and overcome the disadvantages through genetic engineering. Um, sort of viewing each phage as a biological machine that you can tune and improve for different tasks. And in this talk, what I'm going to try to do is give you an overview of the different ways that we do that to try to understand the sequence function landscape of a bacteria phage. So you, if you have this little cartoon phage here, and we sort of dive into the sequence function landscape, and sort of a really classic image of one, you have function on the y-axis, and function here is going to be your ability uh, for that phage to kill or modify a specific bacteria in a specific situation. And across both the other axes, you're going to have changes in the sequence space. And that's that landscape is very rugged. It's got valleys and peaks as you change parts of the phage chassis. Uh, but the trick here is you don't actually know what that landscape looks like a priori, right? It's obscured from you. You don't know where those valleys and those peaks are. If you would take a traditional approach, you know, sort of in, in the science of phage that's gone back for you know, 50, 60 years, where you would pick a plaque and you would, you would characterize that plaque, what you're doing is you're looking at a really tiny sliver of that landscape. You're saying, okay, here's one or two mutations, here's that effect in some certain conditions, and you have this really tiny window into that landscape. Another common approach that uh, is just sort of different versions of passaging a wild type phage. So this is a directed evolution-like experiment. The idea here is that like any virus, phages exist as a quasi-species and you get a lot of diversity in a phage population. And you would take that phage pool and passage it over and over again and select for a specific phenotype. And that approach has very powerful in some circumstances, but you're still really only getting a small window into that landscape. Uh, and I can give you an example that we have in lab that really kind of illustrates this concept. 
So this is an engineered T7 bacteria phage we have in the lab. It's got five mutations throughout the phage genome, and it's efficacious on a particular uh, E. coli pathogen that's resistant to multiple antibiotics that we like to get rid of using this phage. Um, so it's able to lyse that host. It's able to do that very effectively. However, if you were to look at the wild type version of that phage, it has no ability to actually lyse that host. So it's not able to kill that. If you were to look at this quantitatively, and this is, this is a PFU per mil plot of the lock 10 transformed, basically the lower this bar is, the fewer plaques show up for the phage, so the worse it is. So wild type approaches detection here is very bad. It can't actually lyse or kill this host in any way, whereas the engineered variant is able to recover function very well. So that means if you look at a traditional method where you'd sort of cycle variant uh, or directed evolution experiment, you can't actually use that approach. And you can sort of explore why that is if you look deeper into the five mutations that compose that variant. So if you sort of break them down, if the slide transitions, here we go, you can walk through every possible combination of those mutations that make up that solution. So shown here is the number of mutations shown left to right, and the relative fitness shown in a gradient of blue to red, uh, where variants with higher fitness are shown in red and lower fitness are shown in blue. And you can see the winning combination here, five mutations there at the end. Uh, and as you break this down, you'll find that variants that have only one or two composite mutations don't have any activity on that particular bacterial host. It's actually only when you start to get to three mutations that you can start to trace fitness through them, four mutations, and then finally find um, the five mutant variant that's able to lyse that host effectively. So this is essentially a combinatorial. As many phages as there are in a natural population that you can grow in lab, there's still a far greater combinatorial space that you need to explore to reach the solution. Uh, so it's sort of hidden inside that the sequence space of the phage. And the question that we have is, is, is how can we efficiently arrive at these different solutions? And what you need to do is you need to sort of funnel down to the most relevant regions of a phage and say, hey, these are the functional regions. These are the kinds of mutations that affect uh, uh, the ability of the phage to be efficacious on different hosts and look at those different regions to sort of form these kind of libraries. And I can give you, I'll, I'll walk through a few different ways to do that. So again, you look at that sequence function landscape, sort of exploring different parts of it to try to get a better, better understanding of what that looks like. Okay, so we're gonna look at sort of three broad concepts that we work with in lab that are important for this. The first thing is testing unbiased phage libraries. And I'll go into what I mean by unbiased and then testing those on different hosts and in different conditions. So very sort of synthesizing all this information and saying, okay, how can we find out what is the most relevant things that to change to improve a phage chassis for whatever job we want to do? Um, there's a lot of work we can pull from from here, but just to sort of give you spoilers, I'm gonna show you results for two different hosts, a cloning host that is frequently used, a foodborne pathogen, and then in the condition, we'd had a recent publication where we had sent things uh, up to the ISS and incubated things in microgravity. So I'll show you results for that. And again, how we sort of compare all that and merge all the information. So to start with, it's very important that we're able to test an unbiased phage library. And I'll walk through how we're able to do that. Um, a few years ago, we had, uh, had a publication that walked through a process that we call Oracle. Oracle stands for Optimized Recombination Accumulation Library Expression. Um, Oracle came out of me wanting to do a deep mutational scan on part of the T7 bacteriophage, and there not being a method for me to make the library to do that effectively. So we came up with this process to do that, and we use it for a lot of things we work with in lab today. So just to walk through how it works, we'll take a phage chassis, we'll have a gene of interest, we'll get rid of that gene and replace that with recombinase sites, shown here as yellow triangles. Your phage population at that point is entirely acceptor phage, so there's no wild type contamination. So we these phages have this exchanged into them. These phages are passaged on a host that has two plasmid systems. The first plasmid, we use recombinase to swap in a variant member into the phage genome. And the second plasmid will provide a prodigious amount of the wild type version of that protein in trans. And the goal here is to hide the effect, basically, of this uh, gene that you're providing into the phage. We don't want this to skew the library while we're growing it up. Um, so this is all happening while the phage is actively lysing and killing the host. So it's all happening inside of 20 minutes for any particular phage or host reaction. That phage population looks like a mix of recombined phages and unrecombined phages. And again, express, if it's a structural uh, protein, is generally going to be the wild type version because we've covered that with the helper. Uh, then we want to get rid of our unrecombined. We do that with cast and cover selection that targets the remaining acceptor phages. We retain that helper plasmid to provide that wild type in trans. And we wind up with a large population of uh, just our phages that have the gene in the genome, but are, are theoretically not expressing um, the variants. They're expressing the wild type. 
We can then go through library expression and that's just passage through one more host. That does not have any plasmid that allows expression if this is a structural protein um, of that actual library. This whole process is really important for a few different reasons. Uh, the first is sort of illustrated by this super simple tic-tac-toe diagram. Let's say you had three bacterial hosts and three different phages, and each phage is only able to lyse or, or productively infect the, the bacterial host that is its color, so the blue to the blue, red to red, and yellow to yellow. If you were to construct your library with just one of these bacterial hosts, you would lose these variants when you're doing that. Um, and this effect is really crazy dramatic for a lot of phage libraries that we use. So this is just uh, two of the hosts that we'll be looking at later. So these are two different kinds of E. coli, a cloning strain and a foodborne pathogen. And this is how much library you would lose if you did not go through the Oracle system. So you have a massive loss. We don't want that because we want to see the entire picture. The other thing you, you don't have is you don't have a crazy overabundance of wild type. So we don't want a situation like this where wild type and gray and library is like this sort of lower blue individual here where there's a ton of wild type that can make that can cause issues with downstream sequencing and some analysis and then sort of how we iter the different experiments and perform the different experiments. We want the phage pool that we test to be overwhelmingly the library that we put in. Um, so after Oracle, you get about 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 10 phages. 85% of that is gonna be like a variant library. Usually we have another 5% that is sort of set up to be wild type, which we seed into the library. And if you look at library diversity, this is just an example that we have in lab. We had about 99.7% of the variants in this library. Um, and this is just a plot that showed percentage skew. So while we have the helper, it's not always perfect. And in this plot, the zero position is if everything was perfectly evenly distributed, right? But we do get a little bit of skew because there's there's a little bit of expression of that uh, 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 gene that we're putting into the phage. Um, but we have all the members um, in the library that we want to test, except for three in this particular case. And they're there at enough abundance to actually do the experiment. Okay, so Oracle lets us create these big phage libraries and it doesn't necessitate that those variants in those libraries are able to grow on the host we used to make it. So that lets us diversify those pools considerably. That's very important. So now we're gonna talk about testing on different hosts. So what we can do is we can take that unbiased library, we can passage it on different hosts, here shown in different colors. And what happened then, of course, is you get phages that are able to uh, grow, the lice those hosts more efficaciously are going to be produced more. We can then sequence before and after selection and say, okay, these are the variants that worked on this host, these are the variants that worked on this host, and so on and so forth. We have a variety of methods that we can use to sequence these and then create a functional profile. The plots that I'm going to be showing you are from the first domain that we had tested. We've since expanded well beyond this, but this is a nice sort of sample to show. And this is in T7 bacteriophage, and we look at the receptor binding protein of this phage, and in particular, the tip domain. So this is the most of the C terminus, the very end of the foot of the phage, if you will. And so when the phage is trying to land on a host, this is the first region that contacts the host, that initiates contact with the receptor on the host and creates that first binding event. So really what this is doing is when the phage is floating around out there, it's sort of flailing about wildly, trying to find a contact with that receptor. So it's very important uh, for the phage, so it's a good one to look at. Uh, the other reason it's nice to look at as an example is because there is a structure of it. Um, this is the domain. It's called the tip domain. Um, it, this protein is a trimer. Shown here is just one of uh, just one of the proteins. And this region is after this flexible linker, and again, it's sort of the leg of this. So this is the tail fiber of the of the T7 phage is also what this is called. And this is the tip domain. Again, the sort of the first domain that interacts with the bacteria receptor. So very important for phage. So uh, I had mentioned that we wanted to do deep mutational scanning, and this was the first region that we had done that on. Uh, and that's going to be the ex example results that I show for the, uh, for all the different uh, hosts and conditions in the rest of the talk. Um, so just to provide also a little bit of color scheme, um, the blue here is the ex are called exterior loops. These sort of phase down towards the bacteria. And then we have the uh, beta strands that sort of shown in yellow and interior loops that face up towards the phase are shown in red. We'll show this in a very typical heat map. Um, that's going to, and from left to right, we're going to have the topology. So again, that's sort of showing you where in the tip domain you are located, wild type amino acid, the position, and all the different substitutions that, that come into it. So again, if you have in that cell, you're going to have moved to arginine, then histidine, the lysine, and so on and so forth, right? So very typical. I'm going to show these now. One thing to note is that we do not use a tricolor scheme. We don't do that because it improves. We find that the two colors here improves interpretability of the results. So we stuck with that. 
So here, each cell is colored from white to red, where white does badly on that particular, or that uh, uh, white indicates that variant does badly on this particular host, and red indicates it does really well. Wild type is shown in sort of the mid color there with a little dot, and if we're missing a member, it's showing gray. Uh, this is the results on E. coli 10G. This is a cloning host, and I'll just put this up really quickly. This is results, again, for the exact same library on a foodborne pathogen E. coli 121H19. We can explore a few different things inside of these heat maps. Um, so first, the things that we look for when, we, when we're analyzing this data set is regions that drop out consistently across multiple hosts or different conditions. So these are going to be sort of intolerant regions, regions that we want to avoid engineering the phage in the future. We also want to see regions that have um, recover uh, recovery of activity or have improved activity over wild types. So these are the bright red regions here. You can see examples are going to be these positively charged substitutions on E. coli 10G. And where they're localized, well, they're localized to a lot of these exterior loops, right? So they sort of are here, they're pointing down towards the host or they're in proximal locations on beta strands. So it's sort of the phenotype for what recovers function or improves function on that host. And if we then compare that to the pathogen, on it, I love this comparison because it's basically the complete opposite. Um, you see a lot of, most most everything drops out, right? And the things that are enriched are negatively charged substitutions, right? And where are they located? Well, they're mostly located on interior loops, right? So the opposite side of the phage or of the, of the tip domain um, and sort of an opposite kind of substitution. So we get these really dramatic, really striking changes when we test these libraries across different hosts and across different uh, conditions. And what's really interesting and really the most important things that we look for are those positions or uh, patterns of substitution that cause a gain of function in one condition, but a loss of function in another, because those are gonna be the sort of the linchpin key changes you need to make to actually engineer a phage to change its ability to grow on different hosts or overcome resistance, or sort of again, optimize that phage for whatever job that you want to do. Okay, so again, I like these. These are, these are very obvious sort of examples. We've done this on many other hosts, but this is the, I think, you know, a 20 minute talk is the best example of, that we can show right here. So that's an example of how we look at different hosts and how we sort of compare across those different heat maps. Now what we can do is we can look at different conditions, right? And we test a lot of different conditions in the lab, change the salt, change the pH. Uh, but in a recent publication um, or in a recent uh, preprint that we have in BioArchive, um, we had tested uh, T7 phages ability to grow BL21 E. coli in microgravity on board the internet space station. That's a fairly interesting condition to look at. So I'll give that. So we'll look at that example here. Um, and I will want to, I do want to point out uh, Trudekarn, who's a member of the lab and the second author on this paper. She did a lot of work uh, on this and she uh, was very important uh, for the publication. That's me and the boss I'm standing next to her. And then we worked with another a company called Rhodium Scientific and they were the ones who sort of facilitated working with NASA and getting paperwork and sort of understanding everything related to getting the samples from us up to the ISS. So they are very essential for this as well. Um, so the first thing that people usually ask is why, why do you test uh, microgravity? So we're interested in understanding the influence of microgravity for a couple of different reasons. Um, so first, uh, the way the phage works is that it does not actively seek out a bacterial host. It then moves randomly until they encounter a bacterial cell. And can, gravity can influence that motion quite a bit. So there's sedimentation and buoyancy, buoyancy um, caused by gravity that result in the movement of particles in different directions. Um, and that's lacking in conditions of microgravity. So, uh, and that increases sort of fluid mixing. So it increases the, the chance that a phage will be able to enter with the toast. Uh, in addition, in microgravity, materials of different relative densities sort of evenly disperse. That affects nutrient diffusion to bacterial cells. That affects cell motility if cells are motile. And then phage dispersal. And convection is also contingent on temperature changes related to changes in density and is affected then by gravity. So all these things are very different, right? So um, and we're also in this condition, we use a non motile E. coli, so it can't even sort of move around in microgravity. Um, so we, we're, we're trying to do is really force the phage to rely on random motion, only on grounding motion to interact with the host cell, and then assess how that alters the phage's ability to bind to the host receptor in this experiment. Um, at the same time, microgravity is also affecting the bacteria. It's restricting available nutrients, causing waste products to accumulate near the cell. And it's generally a stressor on the bacteria. That can in turn, it can alter how it's able to react to the phage. So in short, it's an extremely different condition. Um, and it's one that you can't replicate for long periods of time to rest with. 
And so if you're curious how we sort of put these together, um, we prepare these samples terrestrially, mix the bacteriophage and, and, and the, the bacterial host. We freeze them, they're delivered to NASA, and then they go up on a rocket, specifically this one. Um, they're incubated, um, then they get a little photo shoot with the astronaut who gets to take them out of the freezer. Um, in this case, the, for the, what we'll be looking at was incubated for about 20 days in microgravity. Then they're frozen, they come back down and we analyze the, that data. Um, so in this study, we have um, other things that we we're looking at. We we're looking at how microgravity affected the ability of both sort of wild type phage to change phage activity and also sequence the phage and the bacteria to sort of pick up different mutations that would show up. But for the rest of this, I'll just be talking about the DMS. And this is the same library that we had shown previously that we tested on, on different strains that we just tested in microgravity. And I will say there is a caveat to this experiment, and that is the experimental restrictions for actually testing things on the ISS are significant. You only get so many samples. Um, the actual handling has to be very simple, so the experiments themselves have to be simple. So in this case, it was just an incubation, and you can't repeat anything. So for the DMS, we had several samples that were not high quality. We really had only one quality, high quality sample that we could look at, and that does limit how much we can interpret the data set. So I would keep that in mind. There's no asterisk next to all the results. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. So um, again, we had run a terrestrial control at the same time. Look at the results. These are what the heat maps look like. These are not going to be as distinct as the ones that we had seen previously, uh, but some takeaways are that we had a lot of successful substitutions in the interior loops and beta sheets um, and clusters of substitutions in the first exterior loop of microgravity. This recapitulates a lot of information that we had previously on the ground. We have this cluster as well in this, in this interior loop. Again, that, that recapitulates some other data that we had that indicate that is an interesting hotspot for a functional activity. Um, I also like a lot of the, apparently, uh, this, this very end position here. If you mutate this stop codon, you get a three amino acid extension. And in both conditions, you actually get gain of activity. So if you if you extend the little C terminus um, of the tip domain, you improve activity over prolonged periods of incubation, which is fairly interesting. Um, if you were to compare these two, this is, this is just... Uh, correlation plot that shows the log two FN score uh, for microgravity and terrestrial conditions. And we were curious to see if, if we could pick anything out um, that worked well in microgravity, which is shown in yellow, um, and that, or versus terrestrial that's shown in green, and say, is there any sort of differentiation we can come out of? Does this give us anything that we wouldn't have after terrestrial incubation? And what we had done is we had actually picked out, I think, I think the top 13 scoring variants on uh, each condition. This is, these are them from the microgravity set, well distributed throughout the tip domain. You can see what each one, what each substitution is here. And we had then tested this on two uropathogenic strains we have in lab that um, wild type does not perform well on, the DMS alone is not able to recover function on. The idea here being, are we able to recover function by combining things that worked well in microgravity that we wouldn't have gotten from just looking at a DMS terrestrially? Um, and this is two EOP plots that show that on two UTI strains. So we have just sort of selected two of the phage variants in the combinatorial set and tested them on plaque assay. And we did see recovery on those in both exponential and stationary phage growth, where we have you know, the wild type doing poorly, so hundredfold round reduction here, for example, and then variant one recovering that function, and the same thing happening to your variant two. Um, so that was a nice finding because again, we were a little worried because we're results are a little underpowered from the ISS experiment. Don't have amazing reproducibility on those, but we were able to gain a function on these uh, by looking at these combinatorial variants. Let me also put these together. Like if you were to go back and look at those five variants, actually two of these um, constitute two of the mutations that are in the subset. The other ones are in the rest of the phage genome data that I haven't shown here. But uh, we had created a sort of test combinatorial set that sort of synthesized a lot of the information that we had had to sort of proof of concept, and these were included in that set, sort of to change to, to test a little baby combinatorial library, and that is how we had got gain of function on this other host. So they were very important. They appear to change function significantly. Okay, so in summary, uh, takeaways here, unbiased libraries are essential for accurately mapping sequence functions, so we need to make sure that we have all the variants. Uh, otherwise, we do get a lot of loss, and a lot of the really, really interesting things that we see in phage um, are ones that work well in one condition, but don't work well in another condition. Second, um, comparison of DMS data sets across hosts and conditions reveals those regions. So again, if it works in one but doesn't work in another, saying this is the stuff, this is how we can funnel down, how we can focus on regions that are token, very relevant for changing and engineering the phase for different functions. And then how, again, understanding those winnows those down and sort of vast combinatorial space 
to create those sort of powerful libraries like alter debate activity. Okay, so I'm exactly at 25 minutes. So just to go through acknowledgements, um, just I'd like to thank everyone in the lab, especially Chudakaran Karn again, who played a big role in the microgravity experiment, the PI, Dr. Boston Oman, and all the sources of funding that have been years. And we can take questions. Thank you for your awesome presentation. So I have a question here from Adrienne. She was interested in the extraterrestrial uh, assay. And she's asking if this type of work could be used to prevent extraterrestrial infections, for example, or something like that. Sorry, can you say that again? If, could this work be used to prevent extraterrestrial infections? Uh, extraterrestrial infections? Yes. That... <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh... <laughs> I mean, mostly what we're concerned on is terrestrial things, right? I guess in, in the context of infections in space, like um, the everything is changing uh, in in like a microbiome uh, in in uh, microbial interactions. So characterizing those more um, is always going to be valuable, right? So you can you can't imagine that if there is something some some kind of bacteria that's able to infect humans better in conditions of microgravity, so during space travel or something like that you would want to have a characterized page that's able to combat those. So yeah, I would say so. Um, I think that's a bit of an extension. Usually we like to look at the terrestrial applications for things, but yeah, any, any increase in information is going to be valuable for engineering phages for different purposes. Okay, thank you. Um, are you mainly, I mean, you, you show this characterization of the, this thick protein, or are you also searching and doing this mutation and scanning other proteins in the patient, for example, glycines or something like that? Yeah, so, well, we've we've extended this fairly significantly to uh, other phages and then proteins throughout. So we had done the, the TIP domain originally because it was a really important region um, and because we could sequence it directly, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so we developed a number of things that, that uh, barcoding, mapping, linking that so to allow us to DMS across the entire protein. And that's the work that's on the right now. Um, but initially, we had started with these 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 domains. So we've expanded expanded considerably. Okay, thank you very much. So we don't have any other questions. I would like to say thank you to both of the speakers that we have today. Uh, well, that's all for today, and we were looking for you for the next seminar that will be in March. So thank you very much to all of you and and the audience that is present today.